Hello and welcome to this presentation on transition management and ketosis. My name's Mike Steele and I'm the dairy coach from Inspire Catalyst Solutions. So what are the aims of preparing for this lactation? Well, firstly, we want to prepare the udder to be nice and clean and healthy and maximise its potential to give milk over the next 305 days. We also want to reduce the disease in early lactation, and there are six main diseases we'll talk about later to do with transition. We want to prevent weight loss in the first peak, up to peak lactation, and we want to reduce social stresses. So social and physical stresses, actually, um, involving, say, heat stress, involving social interactions, and basically make sure that the cow is as comfortable as possible in her early period of lactation. So when we're considering ketosis and energy balance in the cow, really, let's start with just a glass of milk. And if we look at a glass of milk, it's 87% water, 4.9% lactose, 3.9% fat, 3.2% protein, with some traces of vitamins and minerals such as calcium, magnesium and others. Okay. And if we've got 4.9% lactose, that's a lot of sugar. If you consider a cow that's giving 30 litres of milk, say, then 30 litres 4.9% lactose is an awful lot of sugar that's required to actually input into that milk. And that has to come from somewhere. So it comes from the feed that we put into the cow. So it is inevitable that there is a deficit in energy over the period of end of dry period, calving and early lactation. This always happens in dairy cows. It's not our aim to stop that entirely. That's going to be impossible. But what we can do is control it and make sure it doesn't reach dangerous levels that gives us subclinical ketosis and some of those other related diseases that we'll talk about later. So it's all about controlling the energy deficit rather than negating it completely. So as cows get closer to calving, they have less dry matter intake. And this is well documented in literature. And actually, on the day of calving, they may even take in nothing at all to around one and a half kilos of dry matter. In some studies, they can take in more, but really it depends on the experience of the cow, on her on her environment, on all of the stresses that are around there. It's incredibly variable, but the dry matter intake on the day of calving is very low. And then they have to catch up after calving. So they have to have a period of a couple of weeks where they have to catch up with their dry matter intake until they can really reach neutral energy balance or even positive later on in lactation. And what we do know is that cows will overconsume in the dry period if they can. Just like me, if I was given the chance, I would overeat, and the cows do too. And so what we need to do is control this in the dry period. And it has been shown that if we restrict energy intake in the dry period, then they actually give more milk and sooner in the next lactation. So restricting energy in the dry period is a good thing to do. And what we do is we bulk that up with fibre. So it's all about fibre intake rather than energy intake. So we have shown as well that restricted diets also reduce the amount of beta-hydroxybutyrate that is in the blood after calving. Now this is a chemical that's released in the blood of the cow when she's in an energy deficit. So she's using the fat off her own back, usually inside her abdomen. She's using that fat 
she's freeing it up it's going to the liver and it's converting it to beta hydroxy butyric acid bhba which is then utilized as an energy source as a ketone energy source in the udder when it comes to providing milk however this might increase milk fat but it decreases milk yield quite a lot because it takes a lot of energy to do that so we want to restrict beta hydroxy butyric acid building up so feeding dry cows isn't a matter of energy in it's a matter of consistent energy in so we can feed a dry cow 1.35 megacals uh, per, per kilo dry matter per day or we can feed her 1.5 it really doesn't matter studies have shown that that doesn't matter the energy amount as long as it's consistent so that's what we try and do in the dry period when it comes up to feeding cows <clears throat> the other thing to remember when we're trying to feed cows is when they're in lactation cows like to feed together so feeding behavior is all about the cows being a herd animal and they like to feed together and it's been shown that cows if they are allowed to feed together the less socially active cows the ones that are bullied out of the system you assume are going to eat a little bit later when the feed table is free but actually they don't what they do is they actually starve until the next opportunity and that can really restrict their dry matter intake especially in the first lactation when they're finding their way where they don't know where the food source is and they don't know their place in the new milking herd so this is where a lot of stresses can occur so what can we do about that well we can make sure that feed is always available never leave the feed table empty and we make sure that there's enough space for them to feed so 75 centimeters a cow an adult cow in a head and yoke in a head yoke system a neck rail system 65 to 70 centimeters for a heifer and if you've got a post and rail system they're going to need more because some of the socially more bullying dominant cows are going to go sideways so that they get the maximum access to that food and they're going to block the access to the others so you're going to need maybe 80 or even 90 centimeters depending on the size of your cow make sure there's enough water available too 10 centimeters linear access base per cow is what is ideal because if they don't have enough water then they're not going to take in the dry matter dry matter just like us if we ate uh, dry biscuits all the time then we'd need some water to take that in with and cows are exactly the same if they so we need to give them sufficient water access to it's really important clean and sufficient water access so if we're going to talk about transition we can talk about diseases and we can talk about how diseases reduce as well so what diseases are related to transition and there are mainly six diseases we've got ketosis we've got displaced abomasum there's milk fever there's metritis there's mastitis and there is retained placenta so that's your six and transition management is all about controlling those things and if we can do this in three words it's limit system variability and this means that cows like a nice consistent environment because the rumen and the microbes and the bugs inside those rumens need to be nice and consistent if we vary it the bugs vary and the amount of energy they can provide varies too so we want to keep it as consistent as we can so if we're talking about ketosis it's going to happen when there is a net energy loss after calving and there's a build-up of bhba in the blood so generally levels in the blood of over 1.2 millimoles per liter are fairly consistent if it's over that of subclinical ketosis and related diseases you can also measure milk 
and in milk it's 0.1 millimoles per litre. So, how common is ketosis? Well, ketosis is extremely common. One study in the UK in 2018 showed that there was a range that roughly 80 to 100% of herds measured had the presence of subclinical ketosis and clinical ketosis. And if you measure subclinical ketosis within a herd, then it's been measured that in Germany, uh, farms displayed around 42% on average within a herd of subclinical ketosis. France, 39%, Italy, 32%, Netherlands, 48%, and in the UK, 30%. So ketosis is definitely present and you need to look out for it. So what are the consequences? So ketosis is related to other transition diseases. It's like a gateway disease opening the gate for these other diseases. And that can be fatty liver, it can be clinical ketosis, metritis and retained placenta are related to metritis. Displaced abomasum is definitely related to uh, ketosis and also poor fertility. So ketosis cows give on average less milk. They get pregnant later and they have higher culling rates as well. So when we're modeling the costs of ketosis, we can look at direct costs and indirect costs. So direct costs is everything you need to take out of your pocket and pay for. So these are things like, uh, these are things like paying the vet, paying for drugs, those kind of costs that you actually need to pay for. There are other costs as well that are hidden that you don't necessarily see. And this is loss of future milk. So if you lose milk in early lactation, you're actually never gonna pick that up throughout the rest of the lactation curve. So that's future loss that you don't necessarily include. Also, culling is usually an, a related cost. And one study in 2015 showed that this was roughly 257 euro per cow per subclinical case. So what can we do? Can we treat ketosis? Well, yes, but by then it's too late. So you generally treat it with intravenous dextrose or we can drench with propylene glycol. How about prevention? Well, prevention with propylene glycol isn't quite as easy because studies have shown that you can top dress propylene glycol on the feed, but of course they don't eat enough of it over that crucial period of calving and that early lactation period. So what we're trying to do then is to drench the cow with propylene glycol. So this is oral drenching, but with 30% of your herd affected, are you gonna catch late pregnant cows and drench them daily, sometimes twice daily with propylene glycol. I think that's pretty impractical. So there is another way, and that's a, a pharmaceutical product called Rumensin 200. And this is made by Elanco Animal Health, and this can be in top dress or premix form. And in the premix form, this is in a pellet that can be put into the TMR in dry period and in late, uh, and in early, mid and late lactation. And studies have shown that Remensin 200 added to the dry period ration and to the early lactation ration can increase early lactation yields, can crucially decrease the loss of body condition. Now, this is really related to ketosis. So remember, that increase in yield is related to the lack of ketosis and all of those other related diseases. So that's what's actually increasing that yield. And menensin doesn't affect yield to dry matter intake either. So how does remensin work? So remensin goes into the rumen and the rumen is a mixture of bugs. And some of these bacteria can be gram-negative and others gram-positive, so there are two types. 
and the gram negative bacteria are the ones that produce propionic acid, which is an essential and main volatile fatty acid that produces energy for the cow. So we want to favour the gram negatives and that's exactly what menensin does. So what it does is it occupies the gram positive bacteria. It inserts itself like a little hole in their cell wall and it allows ions to come into, into the bacterium. And so the bacteria has to actively pump out opposite ions to make itself neutral. And this requires a lot of energy from the bacteria. So it's not killing the bacteria, it's actually just occupying all of its energy so it can't do anything else. And what you're doing then is you're increasing your propionate and decreasing your butyrate and acetate. And that's increasing the amount of available energy for each bite of food that comes in. So it's making it more feed efficient. And it's that that is allowing the cow to reduce that negative energy balance loss in that early lactation period. So what about if we're using a drug, then what about antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance? Okay, so with menensin, for a start, menensin is not used in any human products at all. And so we're not going to have any form of transfer of bugs from the cow to humans and, and resistance happening there. The other thing to know, notice is from, related to what I just said. So if the, the bugs are occupied with the energy, then as soon as we take the menensin away, that hole is patched up and the bugs return back. To their normal activities. So they're not genetically selected to be resistant by killing the bugs. They're actually just coming back to their own natural cycles when you take the menensin away. So in summary, what we've seen is transition is all about consistency. It's all about providing a consistent environment, a consistent ration, and consistent water availability and consistent low stresses, cow comfort. All of those things are involved in a good transition of the cow from dry to calving. The results of this are better yield, better fertility and lower culling, involuntary culling risk. Ketosis is a system where the cows have an energy deficit. They're using the energy off of their own backs to provide energy for milk production. And what we can do to prevent that is to maximise the amount of energy they get from feed. So we maximise feed access, we maximise space, we minimise stresses, and we can provide things like menensin to maximise the feed efficiency and the conversion of food to energy to reduce body condition loss in early lactation and reduce ketosis. The results of that are better yields, better fertility and lower culling risk. So thank you very much for listening. My name's been Mike Steele and you've been listening to Inspire Cattle Solutions.